I don't think there's many owners of the original PlayStation who hasn't seen this owl pop up on their screen at one point or another. Maybe it's not this exact logo, but you're probably at least familiar with one of the many variants of this owl. Whether it was a demo you got with a magazine, a game you were playing over at your friend's house, or even the very first game you booted up when you got your console. To me, the Cygnosis owl is as synonymous with the PS1 and its history as are the shapes featured on its four face buttons. Sure, a big and integral part of the original PlayStation's success was down to its incredible support from major Japanese studios. I mean, could you imagine the PlayStation if Squaresoft decided to stick with Nintendo instead? FF7 would have looked like Quest 64. No shade to Quest 64 by the way, I do have infinite respect for any game that names its protagonist Brian. But when it came to the West, I'd argue no studio played a more integral part in the success of the PlayStation then Cygnosis, the UK powerhouse publisher slash developer, who even prior to the PlayStation's launch was an incredibly prolific studio responsible for some of the most highly regarded games on the likes of the Atari ST and most notably the Commodore Amiga. Shadow of the Beast, Lemmings and even a cool shoot 'em up where you play as the Cygnosis L called Agony, where the L is so powerful it covers over half the screen with its bullets. You love to see it. They even published a game called Brian the Lion, further bolstering the ever-growing number of famous video game Brian's. Now, I could probably dedicate hours upon hours talking about pre-PlayStation Cygnosis, but that's not what we're here for. No, today we're going to dedicate a sizable amount of time to checking out the game Cygnosis were responsible for on the PS1. Games they developed, games they published, games they ported, and even games they kind of were just in close proximity to in some way or another. We're gonna take a look at every single one because by doing so, we get to take a journey through the life cycle of the PlayStation itself from its humble beginnings to its dying days. And with that, also the rise and fall of one of the UK's most prolific and arguably greatest gaming powerhouses until Sony eventually ate them up and then regurgitated them out like Saturn devouring his son. This is the dumbest image I've ever made. Now just to preface this video, the goal here is to simply take a brief look at each of the games Cygnosis was involved with on the PlayStation in order of release. Now a lot of these games I do plan on looking at a bit more in depth in the future to really give them the proper critical look that they deserve, but for now think of this video as a simple tribute to Cygnosis and their PS1 output. We'll of course be highlighting a lot of iconic and influential games you're probably very familiar with, but also plenty of oddities and deep cuts that may have slipped past you over the years. Now finding out how many games Cygnosis were involved with on the console isn't the easiest task in the world. Wikipedia, Moby Games and even some Cygnosis fan sites are missing entries when it comes to their roster of PS1 games. Now, after a few hours of research, I think I've managed to pull together a de facto list of everything Cygnosis was involved with on the console. Now, for clarity, this list will also include a few games published after Cygnosis was officially merged into Sony in 1999 and renamed Studio Liverpool. But these games are so closely linked to Cygnosis and their history that it's safe to assume if Sig did still exist at this point, they would have been the ones responsible for putting them out on the console. So yeah, you'll see what I mean when we get there. Anyway, by my calculations, we have a grand total of 63 games to get through, a frankly ridiculous number that doesn't make me regret this idea in the slightest. Anyway, as I mentioned before, we're gonna take a look at each of these 63 games in order of release. And what better place to start than with the king? First appearing as part of the PlayStation's European launch lineup in September of the year 1995, we have the original Wipeout. Without a doubt, one of Cygnosis' most recognisable series and arguably one of the PlayStation's most important releases, especially during its early years. You see, at the time, Wipeout was one of the first truly cool video games. It had licensed music from the likes of Orbital, Left Field and the Chemical Brothers, and it had incredible visual design thanks to a collaboration with the British graphic design team Designers Republic, known for their work with Warp Records, and of course, there was the eye-catching and controversial ad campaign, which uh, 
rattled a few heads, thanks to some not so subtle links to club culture and the drug use that came along with it. Wipeout was the game that broke the mold for Sony, latching onto and more importantly respecting the club culture wave that was prevalent across the UK and Europe at the time, made Wipeout cool and as a byproduct of this, it made the PlayStation cool. It wasn't just a console for kids, but for teens and young adults and it was this strategy that arguably set the PlayStation up for its future success with the likes of Tomb Raider, Grand Theft Auto, Driver and so on and so forth. It all started here with Wipeout. I mean people always joke that every PS1 game has an element of drum and bass or jungle in it right? Well you can probably tank Wipeout for that. Anyway beyond the cultural significance of this game, is it any good? Uh, yeah, quite good actually. Now the original Wipeout is certainly a little rough to go back to, especially in comparison to its sequels, which we'll no doubt be looking at in time. But for a first time attempt at bringing anti-gravity racing into the realm of 3D, the game still has a lot going for it even today. The visuals look really good for an early PS1 game, the track design is interesting and memorable, the graphic design work from the Designers Republic looks as fresh as it did back in 1995, and the soundtrack is in my opinion easily one of the most memorable on the console. I know I mentioned the importance of having big name licensed acts in the roster of tunes to really bolster the game street cred so to speak, but the highlight for me will always be the tracks from Psygnosis's in-house composer Tim Wright, aka Cold Storage. Tracks like Chirodrome, Cold Comfort and Tentative are what I hear when I think of Wipeout and are still some of the best tracks you will hear in any PS1 game. Now like I said, this game can be a little hard to go back to nowadays, mostly thanks to its notoriously bouncy handling, but it's a game that any PlayStation owner should have in their collection, especially the European version, just to have that incredible box art on your shelf. Also speaking of European versions, since this was the first game I played, I wanted to test both the North American and PAL releases of these games as a baseline to decide what version of these games I'd opt to play going forward. Now the reason for this is that in spite of North American releases having the superior 60Hz refresh rate, sometimes European made games are better tuned speed wise to PAL's 50Hz refresh rate. And look, a lot of games I'll be showing off going forward will be European made, so I figured that it might be worth testing both the PAL and NTSC version of Wipeout just to see which felt better to play. And as it turns out, I personally found the North American version not only performed flawlessly speed wise in comparison to its PAL counterpart, I also noticed the handling had been tuned somewhat better in comparison to the original European release. Maybe I was just imagining things, but it just felt a little bit better to play in my opinion. Although one downside is that the North American version is lacking the license tracks from the PAL release, so uh, that does kind of suck. So yeah, unsurprisingly, a talented dev like Psygnosis does in fact tune their games properly for different regions. So, for the sake of not upsetting the frame rate fans out there, we will be opting for the North American releases of each game going forward whenever possible, such as right now with our next game. Now technically speaking, 3D Lemmings is probably the first game that we should have looked at on this list since it was another European launch title and alphabetically the number 3 comes ahead of W, but as I'm Irish and can't say that number properly, I hold an unhealthy grudge against it, so there you go. Now truthfully, the reason why I started with Wipeout is that I really wanted to kick things off with a bang and not a whimper, and 3D Lemmings is most certainly a whimper in video game form. 3D Lemmings is of course exactly what it says on the tin, it's Lemmings but now brought into the wild and exciting third dimension. This game is actually a port of the DOS original which launched a few months earlier in the summer of 1995 courtesy of a studio called Clockwork Games. Now would you believe this right here is actually the first time I have ever played a Lemmings game and let me tell you this is absolutely not the first Lemmings game you should play. The goal in Lemmings games is quite simple, you've got a bunch of green haired blue shirted little buddies and you've got to get them to safety by assigning Lemmings roles to help guide them past dangers and obstacles so you can get them home. Now this works very well in 2D and in theory it also kind of works quite well in 3D, but the problem is that the mapping of the controls in this PS1 port are some of the worst I have ever experienced in the game. 
Doing anything from selecting lemmings to moving or rotating the camera is just so goddamn cumbersome that it will likely turn off people within the first minutes of play. It also doesn't help that the extra added dimension also ups the complexity of the game too, turning lemmings from a simple little puzzle game into a rather complex puzzle game that, with controls like this, renders it practically unplayable nowadays. I'm sure this is something people could have learned to live with back when the console first launched, but nowadays this is a game you should probably steer well clear of, especially when you can probably easily play the superior DOS version and also save yourself some controller related headaches. Rounding out our trio of PAL launch titles, we have Nova Storm, which is without a doubt the least interesting of the bunch. Mostly because it's a port of a Sega CD game. This right here is an FMV rail shooter that came on a whopping two discs. And unlike the many other versions of this game released on the likes of the Sega CD, 3DO and DOS, this is the only version that features full screen gameplay, which is probably why it needed to come on two discs. Look, I don't necessarily hate this game, it's a very shallow, very by the numbers FMV rail shooter. Move across the screen, shoot some enemies, dodge some obstacles, kill some bosses, make some coins, and love all my friends. It's basic, but it's okay for a little bit of dumb fun. The main issue with it is that even in 1995, this game was a relic of a bygone era. In comparison to the rest of the PlayStation launch lineup, this game stood out like a sore thumb. And in spite of it coming on two discs, it can be easily finished in under an hour and has very little replay value. Although that being said, it does at least have some nice music and of course, as is tradition with FMV games, some cheesy live action cutscenes. So, you know, it's not all bad. Moving away from the launch lineup, next up we have Discworld, which made its way to the PlayStation in October of 1995. If the name didn't give it away, this is a whimsical adventure game based on Terry Pratchett's series of novels. You know, about the flat world that balances on a bunch of elephants that themselves balance on the back of a giant turtle that floats through space. I'm disappointed to say flat earthers have yet to come up with anything cooler than this. If you like your adventure games full of wacky characters, sarcastic wit and lovely 2D visuals, well, this is likely a game that will appeal to you. Now this game was a mega hit across Europe and not so much in the US, mostly down to its distinctly British sense of humour. Think Monty Python and you've got the right idea. And speaking of Monty Python, Eric Idle voices the main character Rince Wynn, the cowardly wizard who will no doubt be familiar to Terry Pratchett fans. Of course, seeing as this is an adventure game from the 90s, the puzzles are a bit, uh, nonsensical to say the least. In fact, I'd say they're a little more obtuse than usual in this game. So, if you do try it out, make sure to have a guide to hand your first time around. Trust me, you'll need it. Regardless, this is still a charming early adventure game on the PS1 and a worthy game for fans of the genre and Terry Pratchett fans alike. Plus there's an Irish wizard in it and his accent ain't half bad. Is that process by which the wise make space inside their minds for more ideas? Well, it's not half good either. Next up, we have DEFCON 5, in particular, the PAL version of DEFCON 5, because Data East published the North American version and this ain't a Data East video. This game comes courtesy of a team called Millennium Interactive, who would actually go on to be bought by Sony and renamed Studio Cambridge, who would themselves only go on to develop the medieval series of games, and also that Frogger game that sold like, I don't know, a bazillion copies. DEFCON 5 is a pretty interesting game, it's a first person game that kind of seems like an FPS at first glance, but really I'd say it's more of an adventure FPS hybrid. You take the role of a cyber engineer working for a big corporation who sends you out to install and rework the defense systems in one of their deep space mining compounds. Only while you're out there on your own, the base happens to get invaded by hostile entities and it's up to you to repair the ship while also managing the invaders and preventing things from getting out of control. Honestly, this is a very confusing and sometimes overwhelming game, but it's also kind of oddly captivating in a way. It's very slow and easy to get lost in, but also dripping in atmosphere. You are pretty much all on your own in this game, outside of the ship's computers and various messages left on board for you by your employers, which if anything just helps you feel that 
little bit more on edge. It's a game I think you'll need a little time to get into and will almost definitely require a quick read of the manual to understand some of the basics, but it's absolutely one of the more intriguing games on this list. And if you're a fan of the likes of System Shock or just like the feeling of being alone in the internal horror that is space, well, this one might be worth checking out. Yeah, now we're talking. It's time for a bona fide classic, the original Destruction Derby, which was the first PS1 game from a little developer by the name of Reflections Interactive, who you may know for later creating one of the PlayStation's most successful series with Driver, aka the Dark Souls of video game tutorials. So not long after Reflections were killing it on the Amiga with their very successful Shadow of the Beast series, and of course our old friend, Brian the Lion, Reflections brought us their very first racing game, Destruction Derby, which wasn't necessarily famous for its racing, but for how fun it was to just ruin other racers' days. Whether it was on iconic tracks like Crossover, which is pretty much just designed to cause insane pileups, or the simple to-the-point Destruction Derby mode, no game up until this point had made the art of crashing cars so much fun. Sure, it's a little light on content nowadays, and driving can feel a little bit loosey-goosey and, uh, unbalanced at times, but this is still one of the most enjoyable racing games on the console in my opinion, as long as you care more about causing destruction than actually finishing races in one piece. Also, the game features one of the most banging dance soundtracks on the console. It doesn't necessarily match the tone of the game per se, but I can't imagine Destruction Derby without it. This right here is another classic on the console, and also an early sign of the potential Reflections would have later on the PS1. A must own, in my opinion. Kicking off the year 1996, we've got Crazy Ivan, a first-person mech shooter coming internally from Cygnosis. This right here is a pretty simple and straightforward action game. Playing as the titular Crazy Ivan, a member of the Russian military, it's up to us in our giant mech suit to help defend the Earth from some invading mechanical aliens on a journey that will see us traveling across various locations around the globe. On the gameplay front, this is a pretty simple and arcadey example of a mech combat game on the console. Gameplay mostly consists of you traveling around an open map, taking out fodder enemies, with the end goal being to seek out various bosses and take them out in 1v1 arena battles. Once you've destroyed all the bosses, you've then got to seek out and destroy an alien shield generator, and then once that's done, you move on to a new level and do it all over again. Combat is straightforward and enjoyable, the controls ain't too bad, and there's even a simple upgrade system to bolster your mech strength level by level as well. It's not the most exciting or visually enticing mech game out there, but it is fun for what it is, and it's also got another cold storage soundtrack, which is always a plus. Although truthfully, if I was to choose one sole reason to play this game, it has got to be the live action cutscenes and communications between Ivan and his commander, which are frankly comedy gold. The Pompidou Center, gone! No, the Palais de Versailles, gone, gone, uh -huh. all gone. Oh, now the field is moving out towards Euro Disney. What? They're going to waste Disneyland? No way. Let's go! Hold on, Mickey, I'm coming! See? Now that's a 10 out of 10 game right there. Next up, we have Assault Rigs, another game developed internally at Cygnosis. In the far off future, traditional sport has fallen by the wayside in favor of the much more exciting virtual sports, an eSport, if you will. The most popular of which is a VR tank simulator by the name of Assault Rigs. And no, I didn't make any of that up. It is in fact the plot to this game. So yeah, Assault Rigs is exactly that, a VR tank simulator. And you know, this was a game I always kind of wrote off due to how, uh, jank it looked, but as always, judging a game based on its looks alone is a prime dumb guy move, because this game right here is actually a lot of fun. The goal across each of the game's 42 levels is to seek out a number of gems while taking out enemies and collecting power-ups in the process. Now at first glance, it may seem like a pretty by-the-numbers action game, but a lot of the gameplay actually revolved around navigating the environments in search of the crystals, kind of like a platforming game in some ways. Ah, whatever it is, it's a good time. The game features some pretty wacky visuals and environments. You start out in some cool VR zones, but as the game goes on, you'll end up in some high-tech and even modern war-themed environments with an appropriate player tank to match. And unsurprisingly, since it's a Cygnosis game, the music here is pretty amazing too.
I really wasn't expecting much from this one, but it turned out to be a nice surprise actually. So if you like fun arcadey tank games, collecting gems and weird VR environments, definitely give this one a look. A game you probably didn't expect to see on this list, Capcom's beloved horror-themed fighter Darkstalkers does actually belong here. You see, while the original arcade game was of course published and developed by Capcom, the PS1 port was actually handled by Psygnosis, which probably explains why it's one of the better early Capcom fighter ports on the console. We uh, try not to talk about X-Men Children of the Atom, if at all possible. For those unaware, Darkstalkers is pretty much Street Fighter with a Slightly more eccentric characters, I guess you could say. Replace Ryu with a vampire and also add a big mummy and some cat girls and well, you got yourself a winning formula right there. It also doesn't hurt that the game looks gorgeous and the fighting is pretty great too. Needless to say, this dog is excited for a reason. Now as far as PS1 ports go, naturally you can expect a few reduced animations in comparison to the arcade original, but honestly this is a pretty great port with a rock solid frame rate and if you're looking for a good version of the original Darkstalkers, you can't go wrong with this one. Of course normally when it comes to 2D fighting games in the 5th gen, I would usually recommend getting the Saturn version over the PS1 version if you had the choice, but the Saturn never got a port of the original Darkstalkers, so there you go, you're stuck with this version. Unless you opt for the PS2 collection, or the brand new Capcom fighting collection that came out just a few weeks ago with rollback netcode. Yeah, just uh, play Darkstalkers, it rules. Part football game, part advertisement for Adidas sports gear, it's Adidas Power Soccer, once again coming in-house from Psygnosis themselves. Now the PlayStation has no shortage of football games, I mean when you're on the same platform as Chris Kamara Street Soccer, everybody is really just playing catch up ain't they? And Adidas Power Soccer is certainly a football game. It definitely veers more on the arcadey side of things, notably because you can execute things like power shots that create trails of fire, and the gameplay almost requires you to tackle your opponents with reckless abandon if you ever actually want to hold possession of the ball, but hey, that's football. I think for me, what I quite like about this game is the visuals, the stadiums and on-field action are actually quite vibrant in this game, but the football itself I could probably take it or leave it to be honest. It certainly won't be giving FIFA or ISS a run for its money, but for a football game from 96, it would have done the job. It's got a decent selection of teams and modes, and there's even a token Psygnosis team you can play as, who are not to be confused with the other L-based team, Sheffield Wednesday. And most importantly of all, during halftime, literal ads for Adidas products play. Now you may think the concept of adding advertisements into a PS1 game that you pay for kind of sucks and on principle it most certainly does but if you're like me and enjoy old 90s advertisements this actually kind of rules plus you did buy a game called adidas power soccer so you know that's on you Arguably one of the most important series Psygnosis would publish on the console, we have their very first Formula 1 game, aptly named uh, Formula 1. This game was developed by a studio racing game aficionados might be familiar with, Bizarre Creations, known for their work on the Metropolis Street Racing and Project Gotham series, as well as that time they made one of the greatest racing games ever made and Activision promptly killed them for their trouble. They also made Geometry Wars. Can't forget about that. Well, unsurprisingly, a racing game made by Bizarre Creations turns out to be quite good. Even in this early era of PS1 racing games, the original Formula 1 holds up quite well. Sure, the graphics are a little dated compared to what we'd see in later iterations, but the important thing, the racing itself, still feels excellent in motion. What's cool about these early Formula 1 titles, which I really appreciate, is that the games tend to offer up a mixture of arcade and simulation style modes. So if you want to play with simple handling, a rocking Steve Vai soundtrack and checkpoints, there's a mode for that. Or if you want to play the traditional F1 gameplay with accurate handling, pit stops and qualifications, of course there's also a mode for that. It means whether you're a big F1 fan or just a casual racing game fan, 
there's probably something here for you. Of course, either way, this is a game that does cater predominantly to F1 fans, featuring all the tracks, teams and drivers from the mid-90s that will no doubt unlock some extreme nostalgia for fans of this era of racing. Even though the series would receive multiple entries on the console, which we will be getting to, don't worry. The original Formula 1 still holds up as one of the finest racing games you can get on the PS1 and is very much worth having for your collection, whether you're an F1 fan or not. Wipeout 2097, also known as Wipeout XL in North America, is pretty much the perfect sequel. It takes everything we've seen in the original Wipeout, improves the graphics, improves the track design, adds significantly better handling, and features arguably one of the best licensed soundtracks of any video game ever. A time capsule of electronic music from the mid-90s that really just takes the Wipeout experience to the next level. This is where the series would also adopt some of its more recognizable traits. Your ships now feature energy bars and can be destroyed if they take enough damage. Fizar would adopt its iconic blue and yellow color schemes and skilled players could unlock the experimental Piranha Crafts, which would be a series mainstay from here on out. The Design Republic also returned and really outdid themselves here with the logo and UI design in this one, creating another timeless visual feast for fans of that minimalist maximalist look, not to mention the box art for the PAL version of Wipeout 2097 is one of my all-time favorites. It's just so clean. I even have it hanging in my office. It takes up like half the wall space, but I don't care. It deserves it. Also, that soundtrack featuring the likes of the future sound of London, Underworld, the Chemical Brothers, and only freaking Firestarter from The Prodigy, as well as some more cold storage bangers. Wipeout for me has always been a game about getting into a zone. That mixture of high speed gameplay, hyper focus, and driving electronic music is a match made in heaven. And Wipeout 2097 is really where the series began to nail that experience. For many, this game right here is the definitive Wipeout experience, and honestly, I'd have a hard time arguing that in spite of the advancements future entries would make. This is easily one of the finest games Psygnosis would ever put out, and another must own on the console in my opinion. Everybody needs to feel the rush of anti-grav racing the Firestarter at least once in their lives. Trust me. Next up, we have another game with a name change in North America, which you, uh, May want to get used to going forward by the way. It's Lomax, aka The Adventures of Lomax. The second Lemmings game we've come across on our list and safe to say this right here is a very different experience from 3D Lemmings. Not only have we reverted back to 2D, but we've also got ourselves a platformer spin-off, and a very eye-catching one at that. This game sees us take the role of the titular Lomax, a lemming knight who was on a quest to rescue his friends who had been transformed into evil creatures by a guy called Evil Ed. You know when your parents give you the first name Evil, they're just sending you up for trouble, ain't they? This game gives us a very traditional platforming experience, although it definitely veers more towards the realms of European platformers, which means there's a lot of collectibles, and it is also very, very tough. It's actually not quite unlike the original Rayman, although the big difference here is the game's implementation of some of your lemming abilities, which you will be needing to make it past some of the game's many obstacles. It's a nice blend of puzzle and platforming, and actually marries the original lemmings gameplay into a 2D platformer quite nicely. It also doesn't hurt that the game's 2D visuals are really up there with some of the best you'll see on the console, with some lovely visual variety and sprite work across the various levels. Oh, and the music is pretty great too. Did I mention Psygnosis games have great music before? I feel like I might have done that. Anyway, if you're a fan of incredibly difficult 2D platformers with beautiful visuals, Lomax is a game that should be well worth your time. Look, it's Myst, one of the most popular video games ever made. It was the best-selling PC game of all time until The Sims came along and took that honor from it, and it's been ported to pretty much everything ever. And this PS1 port was published by Psygnosis in the West, so that's why it's here on our list. What can be said about Myst that hasn't already been said, it's one of the most influential adventure games ever made. It certainly might seem quite antiquated nowadays with its single screen exploration, but Myst has always been a game that thrives on the atmosphere and mystery of Myst Island itself, and if you're a first timer to that island, 
I think there's still a lot to enjoy here. As for the PS1 port, well, it's certainly not the ideal way to play Myst, but it is fine for what it is. The load times between screens are quick, it has mouse support, and really there doesn't seem to be many compromises over the original, it's just, you know, a basic version of Myst, and in 96, that was more than good enough for most people. Now Myst is absolutely the definition of a love it or hate it experience, and would I recommend the PS1 version over the myriad of other modern versions available? Eh, absolutely not. But if you're a fan of the iconic adventure game and want to own it on absolutely everything, well, you can certainly do much worse than the PS1 port, that's for sure. Hope you aren't sick of adventure games yet, cause we're straight into another one. It's the two disc epic Chronicles of the Sword, coming from developer Synthetic Dimensions in November of the year 1996. This game sees a return to some classic medieval tomfoolery as we take the role of the young knight Gawain on his quest to stop the evil witch Morgana, and I'm gonna level with you guys. I did not like this game very much at all. While it does have some redeeming features, including its detailed backgrounds, pleasant music and professional voice acting, the game also features pretty much every major downside of the adventure game genre, from confusing puzzles to awkward and very slow navigation, but probably most criminally of all, it's just really, really dull. The story, the characters, nothing here really grips you and makes you want to push on through the mindless exploration and item hunting. Discworld had its flaws, but the experience both games offer are night and day in terms of fun factor. I suppose if you really wanted to experience a classic and traditional medieval adventure on the PlayStation, this might be up your alley, but otherwise, just avoid this one unless you really want a pricey two-disc cure for insomnia. Rounding out the year in 96, we've got ourselves another high profile follow up to a beloved Cygnosis classic. It's Destruction Derby 2, once again coming from Reflections Interactive. Here's another game that shows what a good sequel should do. It bumps up the graphics, improves the gameplay, and gives you more to do. But most importantly, it retains the key elements of what makes Destruction Derby fun, which is smashing into cars with reckless abandon. Plus, it features a character called the Trash Man. So clearly, things are moving in the right direction. Now, even though this game is notably improved over the original, there are still a few aspects I prefer from the original Destruction Derby. For one, I think the difficulty in the sequel has spiked significantly, making the already somewhat difficult and unpredictable races even tougher to beat this time around. Also, the game's soundtrack has shifted from the dance-heavy tracks of the original to a more hard rock and metal focused sound, which while still good and admittedly fits the game's aesthetic much better, just isn't as memorable to me on a personal level. Except for the ominous menu team of course, you uh, don't forget that one anytime soon. If I had to pick one, I'd still say I prefer the original just that little bit more, but you really can't go wrong with either of Reflection's Destructive Racers, although if you're in these games specifically for the Destruction Derby mode, 2 undoubtedly has a better range of arenas to smash up some cars, including one arena with a pit, and honestly, who doesn't love a good pit, am I right? Even though there will be more Destruction Derby games in the future, this would be Reflection's last entry in the series, although this isn't Reflection's last Cygnosis game. What game is that, you ask? Well, we're just gonna have to wait and see, aren't we? Kicking off the year 1997, we have probably the most dramatic name change we'll see on this list. Riot, also known as Professional Underground League of Pain in North America, is a high action sports game set in the future, coming courtesy of the team at Beyond Reality. This game features a fictional sport that kind of plays like a mixture of rugby, basketball and handball, I guess? Two teams of four players have to take control of the ball by any means possible and then bring the ball over to their side of the court to charge it up. And once your ball is charged, all you gotta do is shoot it into the goal located in the center of the court. And depending on what part of the court you shoot from, you can then score anywhere from one to three points. It's a fast paced and fun take on a traditional sports game that 
actually plays quite well. It's probably not the deepest or most technical fictional sports game you'll find on the console, but there's a nice range of leagues, teams and arenas to play in, and it would no doubt be a bit of fun with a few friends around. Definitely one of the more obscure titles on this list, but honestly, if you're into futuristic or alternative sports games, this one should be worth checking out for a few hours at least. Following up after the game with maybe the longest name on the PlayStation, we've got another game challenging for that accolade, and our first PAL exclusive on the list. It's Adidas Power Soccer International 97, the follow-up to the original Adidas Power Soccer. What's new this time around? Well, not a lot really. In true football game fashion, this sequel adds a whole host of new teams to the mix, with additional leagues from Spain and Italy, as well as 56 national teams to really bolster up the original game's roster. As for the gameplay itself, well it's majorly unchanged from the previous game, once again offering up a very arcadey style of football with power shots, tricks and dangerous, dangerous tackles that oftentimes feature no repercussions whatsoever. So while there's not much new, it is a better version of the previous game and as a bonus, it also features some updated Adidas ads, so if you want to see some highly engineered shoes kick a football to some nice music, well, this is the game for you. Hey, remember Clockwork Games, the guys responsible for Treaty Lemmings? Well, they're back, and thankfully, with a much better game. Speedster, also known as Rush Hour in North America, is a top-down arcade racer that answers the question, what would Micro Machines look like if it was modelled after realistic cars? And, well, here it is. Now, I say realistic, but really I just mean in a visual sense. Speedster is very much an arcade racer at its core, with simple pick-up-and-play controls and checkpoints aplenty. The game gives you a total of two different vehicle classes to play through, both High Performance and the aptly named Heavy Metal, giving you two different styles of vehicles, as well as numerous cars to unlock across both classes. In many ways, this is simply an enjoyable no-frills racer. There's nothing particularly exciting or unique about it, but it does have a nice selection of tracks and cars. It looks nice, it plays nice, and most importantly of all, it's got a ridiculously good soundtrack. So, if you like rock and tune, and a bit of the old top-down racing, this is a game you really can't go wrong with. Hey everybody, put your hands up if you think we've gone too long without an adventure game showing up. Well, worry no more friends, cause it's time for The City of Lost Children, the 1997 release based on the French movie of the same name. Unlike the other adventure games we've seen on the list so far, this one has the distinction of being developed with the PlayStation in mind, and as such, it's probably one of the most visually impressive and distinct looking games we'll look at today. Now that doesn't mean the game is free from the usual adventure game confusion and woes. In fact, this game might be one of the most difficult, both in terms of what it asks you to do, and how difficult it is to find certain items. Seriously, some of the stuff in this game I think would be almost impossible to figure out without a guide. It is pixel hunting to the extreme, let me tell you. Although, in spite of that, there's really something quite special about the characters and world presented here. It's another game that's heavy on atmosphere, and while the gameplay is admittedly uh, not very fun at all, the visuals, environments and music still kept me intrigued enough to play on for a little while at least. If anything, playing this game just made me want to check out the film the game is based on, and I mean one look at the trailer to this thing and I was sold immediately. It seems absolutely insane in the best possible way. So maybe check out the film first and if you like that and think you can tolerate some exceptionally difficult adventure game action, well then maybe the City of Lost Children on the PS1 will be worth your time. <laughs> If I had to pick one game on this list to win a prize for the most ambitious and out there concept, no doubt about it, Sentient would be the winner. This 1997 release, developed internally by Psygnosis, is a first person adventure title that once again sees you traversing a space station deep in, well, you know, space. Although unlike Defcon 5 where you're on your own to defend the station, Sentient actually has a whole cast of characters and crew to interact with on your journey. And when I say interact with, I really mean it. This game features one of, if not the most complex and fully featured dialogue systems on the whole console, allowing you to have fully fleshed out 
and surprisingly realistic conversations with almost any character aboard this ship. The plot centers around the player character being sent to the space station Icarus to investigate a bout of radiation sickness that is being affecting the crew, but soon after arriving, things begin to unravel further with the captain mysteriously dying and a power struggle kicking off between the various sectors of the ship. Also to make matters worse, the space station is also on a collision course with the sun, which you know, for obvious reasons, uh, ain't great. What's cool about this game is that it all takes place in real time and also has a ton of potential paths and endings depending on the actions you take throughout the game. Who you talk to, where you go and who you help all factor in heavily. It's a very strange, ambitious and surreal game that will probably take a little while to figure out and get into, but it's incredibly fascinating. Even the graphics are quite good too. Well. The space station that is, the characters' faces, which are actually models using facial scans of the staff at the dev studio, are, uh, well, they're full of character, let's just put it that way. Certain versions even came with a soundtrack CD that's meant to be listened to while playing the game, and this CD is well worth listening to, even outside of the game. It's a game that has many issues, and it certainly won't be for everybody, but it's hard not to admire the complexity and depth Sentient offers, and it is without a doubt one of the PlayStation's most unique and fascinating titles. Life Force Tanka, also known as Codename Tanka, is Cygnosis' attempt at a fully polygonal console FPS. This is a game I've played a lot of, not because I owned it or even rented it back in the day, but because a demo of the game appeared on the version of Demo 1 that I received with my original PlayStation, and like any good European PS1 owner, you become very familiar with whatever games are featured on your version of Demo 1. So now that we're trying out the full version for the first time, how is it? Not bad actually, at least for an early console FPS. Tenka is pretty much the dictionary definition of a corridor shooter, not because it uses the classic Doom formula of finding coloured keycards, which it absolutely does by the way, but the game majorly takes place in tight and claustrophobic corridors that happen to be quite dark and also happen to feature some pretty horrifying enemies trying to take you out. In fact, I'd almost go as far as to say this is kind of a horror shooter. Many times while playing this thing, I got caught off guard by some spooky enemies rushing me out of nowhere, and the aforementioned dark and tight locations don't help ease your nerves either. As for the controls, well, it's an early console FPS game, but at the very least it features a pretty standard control scheme for the time, so if you're comfortable with d-pad turning and shoulder strafing, you'll have no problem with this one. Interestingly, one of the game's biggest gimmicks is your weapons, or should I say, weapon. The game features just one, a gun that evolves and upgrades as you go throughout the game, acquiring new features like extra barrels and a whole host of new ways to tear apart the horrors you'll face in these dark industrial environments. As far as console FPS games go, I'd say this one probably runs in the middle of the road due to its cramped level design and rather high difficulty, but it does have some great atmosphere and visuals as well as another banging cold storage soundtrack, so if you like your console FPS games dark and spooky, well, this one should be worth a look. So here we are back in the land of Flat Earthers, it's Discworld 2 Missing Presumed, also known as Discworld 2 Mortality Bites in North America. I know all the name changes seem a bit excessive, but we've plenty more to come, don't you worry. Discworld 2 is in my opinion a notable improvement over the original game, which itself was already pretty damn good. While the gameplay hasn't changed a whole bunch, what has changed are the visuals which see an impressive upgrade to this almost animated 2D style, making it look like you're playing a cartoon rather than just a simple 2D adventure game. The characters and environments are some of the nicest and most expressive 2D work you'll see on the console and really help bring Terry Pratchett's world to life on your PlayStation. It's clear to see the huge success of the original game help them up the budget this time around, and it's nice to see that that money was put to good use. Although probably the most notable improvement, at least in my books, are the puzzles, which are nowhere near as out there as the previous games. In fact, I'd say some of the solutions to the puzzles in this game actually make sense and can be figured out by using logic, which is really a rare sight to behold for the genre. Of course, not everything in the game works that way. I mean, it is a Terry Pratchett game after all. It does have to be 
a little bit weird and obtuse from time to time. You say that I'm a silly little gimp, and I say go away, oh. Cause I'm smelly over here, I'm smelly over there. I'm smelly, smelly, smelly everywhere. Yep, that's Pratcha, all right. But hey, this world too is funny, charming, and also a lot of fun. So really an improvement in every conceivable way, and one of the best adventure games you can get on the console. Fans of the genre, do not sleep on this one. Moving on from one of the best adventure games on the console to arguably one of the best racing games on the console, it's Formula 1 97 aka Formula 1 Championship Edition in North America, coming to the PlayStation once again from Pizar Creations and launching unsurprisingly in the year 1997. This is yet again another great follow up to an already great game, improving things in all the areas that matter from the graphics, sound, modes, features and controls. The game features all the tracks from the 97 seasons, even more teams and drivers, and most notably of all, a whole host of racing tweaks and car setup options, which really take the extra steps into making this a comprehensive F1 experience and simulation, rather than just a simple Formula 1 themed racer. That being said, if you're like me and just want to dive right in and have a good time, the great arcade mode returns again, and is even better than before, with some amazing handling that makes the game just a blast to pick up and play. Many would argue that this right here is the pinnacle of Formula 1 gaming on the PlayStation, and really given the features on offer and the pedigree of the studio behind it, I would find it hard to disagree. Unfortunately though, this right here would be the last F1 game Bizarre Creations would work on, as well as the final game Bizarre Creations would make with Psygnosis, meaning from here on out, the remaining Formula 1 games on the console, well, they're gonna have some big shoes to fill. Either way, Formula 1 97 remains one of the finest racing games on the PlayStation and is an excellent swan song to Bizarre Creation's brief run on the console. Here's Overboard aka Shipwreckers in North America, another beloved game that appeared in my copy of Demo 1 and yet another game that I've never played the full version of prior to this video. So I think it's about time we change that. Overboard is a very simple and cute pirate action adventure title where the goal is to navigate your little pirate ship through oceanic environments in this fun top-down isometric style. The gameplay features a mixture of ship-to-ship -ship combat with some traditional and uh, less traditional nautical weaponry as well as plenty of obstacles to dodge from giant buzzsaws to flaming turrets and let me tell you, never has there been a game where being set on fire has been so annoying so yeah don't get set on fire. The game has a ton of levels across various different environments that get bigger and more complex as the game goes on. The goal is usually just to find a number of objects in an area and then exit the level, but eventually you'll be flying, diving and checking the map a whole lot if you want to make it to the next level. What surprised me about this game is that in spite of its cheery and cute outer shell, Overboard is actually a brutally hard game with some very tricky sections and relentless enemies that crank up the difficulty factor more than a few notches, plus getting set on fire really does suck and seemingly everything in this game likes to do that to you so uh, good luck with that. Regardless though, this is a fun and unique little title on the console and in spite of the PlayStation's ridiculous library of games, this is actually the only pirate game I can think of on the platform so I guess by default it's both the best and worst pirate game on the PlayStation, an accolade I'm sure it can be proud of. Next up, we have what I would consider one of Cygnosis' defining games on the PlayStation, the original two-disc cyberpunk epic G-Police, which made its way to the console in October of 97. What we have here is an aerial combat game, heavily inspired by the world of Blade Runner, where we take command of a VTOL aircraft as a member of the titular G-Police, an organization dedicated to combating organized crime within the colonized Callisto moon. There's so much to love about this game, whether it's the dark atmosphere cyberpunk environments, the excellent close quarters aerial combat and objectives, or the incredible soundtrack from Stuart Duffield, G-Police is a hell of a good time with a staggering number of missions to boot. Sure, those two discs are dedicated to a healthy dose of the old story and FMV cutscenes, but the game boasts a ridiculous number of missions too, making this one of the beefiest games of its kind on the console. It also supports some pretty fancy features too, including a slider to adjust the draw distance of the 
world, so you can prioritize frame rate if you like, which is a very rare option to see in a PS1 game. Although, whatever way you adjust it, you'll probably need to get used to a little draw distance anyway, but the game still looks great regardless, and the choice to section off the environment into individual sectors across the map allows for some great detail and variety across the game. Now, many out there will argue the biggest issue with this game is its controls, which after playing this again for the first time in a long time, are honestly pretty good. I don't know if this is just because I spend the majority of my gaming time these days playing PS1 games, so I'm just kind of used to PS1 era control quirks, but seriously, I had no issue moving with precision in this game, and that's a good thing, because G-Plees can get pretty tough pretty fast too, so you'll want to be on your A-game. This for me is easily one of the top flight games on the platform, and maybe the best close quarters helicopter style game on the whole PS1? I don't know, I'll leave it up to you at home to decide, but at the very least, whether you check this game out or not, make sure to watch the animated advert for this game that was directed by Peter Chung of Aeon Flux fame. It's one of the best video game adverts ever, and if I can't sell you on the game, this probably will. Hey, remember those scamps over at Reflections Interactive? Well, they're back in monster truck form. Monster Trucks, aka Thunder Truck Rally over in North America, is the final game Reflections made with Cygnosis, and considering the popularity of the Destruction Derby series, this game is a surprisingly obscure one all things considered, especially seeing as it's pretty much Destruction Derby, but with monster trucks. Well, I suppose that's being a little bit reductive, but uh, yeah, that's more or less what we got. Also, the characters are anime inspired now, which is uh, a little odd for a game like this, but we'll roll with it. Obviously, the major difference here is the switch from cars to these big bouncy trucks. You still do a lot of racing, but instead of focusing too much on destroying other racers on the track, your big worry should actually be not wrecking your truck by going over too many big jumps or hazards in your way. I was quite surprised that in the very first race I attempted, I ended up wrecking myself because for some reason, I thought a massive truck like this could handle a few big air jumps and I suppose when you actually consider the physics and weight involved in these things, it uh, probably would get a fair bit of wear and tear, wouldn't it? Beyond the standard races, another change in this game are these more free-form races where instead of following a set pathway, it's up to you to reach a series of checkpoints in any way you see fit. And in case you are wondering, going very slowly up an incline is not an ideal way to do it. And replacing the Destruction Derby mode, this time we have the Monster Truck Classic Crushing Cars, which unfortunately is nowhere near as fun as it sounds. If anything, it's unfortunately quite miserable to be honest. This game is fine I suppose, but in comparison to Reflections past and future games, it's probably no surprise this one is the black sheep of the bunch, let's just put it that way. But hey, if you like monster trucks, this is still probably one of the better options on the console. Roscoe McQueen Firefighter Extreme, simply known as Roscoe McQueen in PAL regions, is a 1997 release from a dev studio called Slippery Snake. Now in Europe, this game was published by Sony themselves, but roughly one year later, Cygnosis helped bring the game over to North America, so here we are. Unsurprisingly, in this game we're playing as the titular Roscoe McQueen Firefighter Extreme, and it's up to us to single-handedly put out fires being started by evil robots across many floors in a towering inferno, while also rescuing a bunch of civilians hanging out dangerously close to said evil robots. Seems like a pretty stressful job to be honest. I hope Roscoe is being paid well. Obviously the major gimmick of this game is the firefighting itself. Robot starts a fire, you put it out before it gets out of control, and then you smash up the robot with your axe. Rinse and repeat. This is a pretty simple game all things considered. There's a little platforming, a little exploration. It's a game that honestly gets quite repetitive rather quick and is a little janky if I'm being kind. Well. It's very janky actually, but regardless, I thought it was kind of fun for what it is, even if it is admittedly a little mediocre. It has an air of that classic mid-tier PS1 charm, a game that isn't really all that great, but if you had it as a kid, you probably would have loved it all the same, even in spite of its flaws. But the important question, is this the best firefighting game on the console, even in spite of its mediocrity? No, absolutely not. Not while the Fireman 2 exists anyway. Seriously, play the Fireman 2. That game's pretty great.
one that I'm sure a lot of you were waiting for. It's time for another two disc epic with Colony Wars making its way to the PlayStation in late 1997. Similarly to G Police, Cygnos has put a lot of stock into this title and once again, it's an aerial combat game, a space combat game to be exact, and oh boy, is it a doozy. This game sees you take the role of an army recruit to the League of Free Worlds, a group of space colonies who have banded together to fight against the tyrannical Earth Empire and its colonial navy. It's a classic space opera with plenty of twists and turns, and it makes for one of the most compelling narratives you will see on the console. It also probably helps that the game itself is one of, if not the best, space combat games on the platform. Amazing graphics, exhilarating combat, an epic score once again provided by Cold Storage, who is really flexing his musical range with this one, and of course the gameplay and missions live up to the grandeur of the story Cygnosis has presented. Also, one of the coolest parts about this game is the branching story. You see, if you fail a mission in this game, it doesn't always lead to a game over. In fact, it could lead you down a completely different story path. So your results in individual missions will have an overarching effect on the story and can lead to a variety of different endings, meaning you can play the game multiple times and each time you go through, there could be an entirely different set of missions leading to a new ending each time, depending on how you perform. It's really quite cool. Needless to say, I think quite highly of this game, as do generally most of the people who have played it. It can be pretty tough at times, but I think its controls and wider open arenas do make it a little more newcomer friendly in comparison to G-Police, but this game right here is the beginning of one of the console's best and most iconic franchises, and if you've yet to try it, you should rectify that as soon as possible. Whoa, what's Alundra doing here? Well, Cygnosis published it in Power Region, so yeah, we're talking about Alundra. Originally released in 1997 from Japanese developer Matrix Software and later brought to the West by Working Designs, complete with fancy Working Designs translation, Alundra is widely considered to be the console's best 2D action RPG. Basically, if you wanted the PlayStation's equivalent of a classic 2D Zelda experience, only now with some fancy 32-bit sprite work, well, here it is. Although I suppose simply comparing it to Zelda does do the game a disservice. Alundra has a lot of great things that make it unique in its own right, most notably its excellent story and characters, which are definitely a little more fleshed out than the usual action RPG, which is probably why it's a good thing working designs were behind the translation. Throw in some excellent combat, lush 2D environments, and a cracking soundtrack, and well, this one is a no-brainer for fans of action RPGs or a you know, good games in general. Plus it has one of the best town themes of any game, and I will die on that hill. <laughs> Rounding out the year 97, we've got another game in everybody's favorite football series. It's Adidas Power Soccer 2, once again launching exclusively in PAL regions at the tail end of December 97. This time around, we have a new developer at the helm called Shen Technologies, and Honestly, for the most part, the gameplay here still remains mostly unchanged. If you enjoyed the previous game's wacky blend of simulation and arcade-style football, you'll probably enjoy this one too. The game received a nice little bump in the visual department, and once again, we've got even more teams and stadiums to play around with. And if there's one thing I like about this series, it's that the stadiums always end up looking pretty striking on the visual front. I know it's a bit of an odd thing to focus on in a football game, but I'm generally not that big on football games, so I kind of take what I can get. Other highlights include a pretty decent soundtrack, some interesting and visually striking UI design, including a handy visual tutorial that teaches you how to take out your opponents with a flying kick, which is always handy. Not to mention some new wacky CGI cutscenes, which are always appreciated. Although unfortunately, this version does seem to be lacking the Adidas ads that were present in the previous game. And I mean, without the ads, what's, what's even the point? Well, I suppose there is the football. That's nice, I guess. Would you look at that? We've made it to 1998 and also the halfway point of this video, which means it's time for Shadow Master, a very unique FPS from British studio Hammerhead Games, who are also responsible for the very impressive PS1 port of Quake 2 and also Jinx, that weird PAL exclusive jester platformer that came out in 2003, which means nobody's ever played it. What's cool about this game is that it takes place across a variety of unique sci-fi worlds, which leads to quite a diverse roster of locales, and more importantly, 
enemies to fight. Also, to mix things up even further, your player character sits within this futuristic all-terrain vehicle, meaning it's actually a vehicular FPS. Although, as a result, the gameplay has this very shaky, almost VR-like motion, which I imagine would make those with motion sickness very uneasy after some extended play sessions. Thankfully though, that doesn't happen to me, and I found it kinda cool. Now for the most part, if you were gonna judge this solely for its FPS gameplay, it's a pretty standard experience for the time. Explore the mostly linear levels in search of keys and items to progress, pick up new weapons, destroy some bosses, all that good stuff. Really for me, what makes this game appealing is just how interesting and unique its setting is. Even nowadays, there's really not a whole lot like it. Not to mention, the graphics here are stunning for a 98 release. I'm not surprised these guys were drafted in to make the Quake 2 port after making something that looks like this. Also, the soundtrack kinda rules too, which is always a big plus. Sure, the gameplay isn't anything groundbreaking and the shaky cam might be a bit much for some people, but if you're looking for an FPS that certainly stands out from the rest, Shadow Master is worth checking out. Next up, we have the one and only game from Traveler's Tales on this list. It's the Psygnosis published Rascal, a platformer that everybody loves to hate. Mostly because it's a platformer with wacky tank controls and bizarre fixed camera angles. In this game, we play as Callum Clockwise, aka, eh, uh, Rascal, as we go on a journey through time to rescue our father, who also happens to have a lab capable of time travel under his home. That's convenient. The levels in this game usually require you to move through various rooms searching for keys to further progress through the level. This often requires a bunch of platforming or bubblegum based combat as is tradition, and you know what? From the brief amount of time I played this one, I didn't really think it was all that bad. It's certainly not great, but still, it was fine. The gameplay is nothing original and the tank controls are uh, an acquired taste, let's just put it that way. But I enjoyed the platforming that was there, the environments look pretty cool, and the game also runs at 60 frames per second, which is unusual for a 3D platformer of its day. and. Honestly, quite impressive. It probably helps that every area in the game tends to be broken up into small rooms separated by short load times, but hey, it works. Traveler's Tales would go on to create much better 3D platformers on the console, most notably with some rather good Disney Pixar titles, but if you think you can tolerate some weird tank controls in your 3D platformer, this really ain't the worst thing in the world. Also, the music goes really hard for some reason. Seriously, break beats on the PS1. Name a better couple. Well, would you look at that? It's another racing game that happens to look a whole lot like a certain Formula 1 series that we've talked about recently. Well, this is Newman Haas Racing, which is essentially Formula 1, but instead it's based on the IndyCar series over in North America. It was even built on the same engine as the original Formula 1, but unfortunately not its follow-up Formula 1 97, so it is a little antiquated in comparison, but hey, the original Formula 1 was still good, and would you believe it? So is this game. This was the first game developed by the team at Studio 33, who are a name we'll see a couple more times throughout this video. The good news is that even without bizarre creations at the helm, the racing gameplay still remains as tight and fun as ever, alongside a few new tweaks and camera angles which do help add a nice little twist to things. Once again, you can expect a decent collection of real life racetracks as well as licensed teams and drivers, but of course what sets this apart is that it's based on the IndyCar series, which has much less representation on the console. Also, this game has a Psygnosis team car, which is literally all they needed to sell me on the game. The game does unfortunately seem to lack the distinct arcade modes that are prevalent in the Formula 1 series, but you can still adjust the racing settings to cater to your preferred playstyles, and with a decent length championship mode to get through, two player mode, and all the usual bells and whistles, this is another decent racer that will appeal to those who like their racing games a little bit more grounded in reality and uh, on American soil. Who is ready to spice up their life? I know I am, because it's Spice World time, which thanks to Cygnosis publishing the title over in North America, we're going to be talking about today. Now, I won't lie to you, when I was a kid, this was always what I considered the worst PS1 game, partially because I didn't like the Spice Girls when I was a kid, and partially because it was also really, really bad. But today, I'm a responsible adult, and thankfully more appreciative 
of the 90s pop perfection that is the Spice Girls, and that includes the movie Spice World, which is really just a fun parody of A Hard Day's Night, and also really, really dumb, but, like, in a good way. So, what about the PS1 game, then? Eh, still one of the worst PS1 games ever, but I do also enjoy it more now, mostly just because of how cool it looks. I know these Spice Girls models got a lot of flack back in the day for their designs, but these are such a fun time capsule of the era and are actually kind of charming, I think. The whole game actually has this really nice pre-millennium aesthetic that is just a joy to experience. It's just a shame that the gameplay is really, really shallow if you even wanted to call it that. First, you've got to make a mix from a selection of Spice Girls songs, only you have about 30 seconds of the song to work with, so whatever mix you make is gonna sound terrible. You've then got to dance to it by playing a terrible rhythm game, record a video of the group dancing, and then edit the video with a limited set of options, and that's it. It's as basic as a game can be, and also the saves somehow take up a whole memory card, which is insane. Now, if the game has one saving grace, is that it contains a decent chunk of behind-the-scenes interviews with the band, which are actually pretty funny. So, should you play this game? No, it is very bad. But it's also a fun little time capsule of cool 90s design and Spice Girls history, so if you're a diehard Spice Girls fan or like nice UIs, uh, it's probably worth booting up at least once. Also, the developers of this game, Team Soho, would later go on to develop The Getaway on the PS2, so that's kind of funny. Oh, we're back to Adidas Power Soccer again. That was quick. Although technically we have moved on to a new year, and I suppose this is the last game in the series and also launched in North America this time, so we should probably get hyped. Yes, this is the final Adidas Power Soccer game, once again developed by Shen Technologies and launched to coincide with World Cup 98. You know, the one with the fun bird mascot. Now, as you'd expect, this is very similar to Adidas Power Soccer 2, although considering the short period between releases, Power Soccer 98 does offer some considerable improvements in the graphics department, as well as by far the largest roster of teams and stadiums we've yet to see in the game. Sure, the gameplay itself is relatively unchanged, but if you play all these games back to back, this for sure feels like the one that has evolved the most. Also, there's no way I can talk about this game without mentioning the incredible opening cutscene, which is by far one of the most insane things ever put in a football game. It's like five minutes long and is almost worth buying the game for this alone. If you only had to pick one version of Adidas Power Soccer, I'd say this one is probably the best, although there is something quite charming about the original as well. Probably the Adidas adverts. Well, don't worry, they're back in 98 too, and even more dramatic than ever. Yeah, that's the stuff. Next up, we have a game that I've actually done a full review for on the channel already. It's Blast Radius, the debut game from a new Psygnosis studio, Studio Camden. This right here is basically Colony Wars, but if you took away all the politics, story and branching paths and instead up the action intensity and uh, basically arcadified the whole thing. Look, we've even got a point system this time. How quaint. And you know what? This is actually a winning formula in my book. The combat in Colony Wars was so enjoyable, it's nice to actually have a more streamlined version that you can essentially sit back and turn your brain off with. Plus, they also replaced the epic space music with drum and bass and jungle. You love to see it. I'll leave a link in the description to my full review if you want to learn more, but no doubt if you like Colony Wars or arcadey space combat games, this is a nice deep cut on the console and very much worthy of your time. And the ships also look real cool, so there you go. What's not to love? Oh baby, it's time for the beach ball puzzle greatness. That is Cooler World, aka Roll Away, aka the greatest game ever made. Well, okay, maybe it's not the greatest game ever made, but it is one of the best puzzle games on the PlayStation. That, I am certain of. So in Europe, Cooler World, as it was known, was the product of a Swedish studio by the name Game Design, uh, Sweden, who ended up impressing Sony so much with one of their Net Eurozy demos 
that they got the go-ahead to make a full retail release, and Cooler World was the result. Now, Sony themselves handled the publishing duties in PAL regions, but for North America, Psygnosis took the reins, and one name changed later to the infinitely less fun Rollaway, and here we are. Cooler World is a masterclass in puzzle game design, creating an incredibly addictive game that's both easy to learn and hard to master, that pretty much just revolves around you doing two things, rolling a ball and jumping with it from time to time. Your goal in each level is to simply find a set number of keys and then make it to the exit in the allotted time, with bonus points to be earned by picking up collectibles along the way. Of course, the game regularly mixes things up by throwing in new obstacles and gimmicks, making sure they keep you on your toes as you move through the game's whopping 200 levels, which also thankfully features some regular visual updates as well to keep things fresh. I don't know why, but I always get overly excited whenever I get a new ball. It's just the simple things in life, you know? Honestly, I don't think there's a PlayStation owner in Europe who hasn't played this game on a demo disc at least once in their lives, and it's a testament to its fun factor that in spite of its simplicity, Cooler World remains a beloved favourite amongst PlayStation fans everywhere and is easily one of the most owned puzzle titles on the console, even if you gotta opt for the version with the crappy name. Have you ever booted up a game not knowing what to expect and a few minutes in you have way more questions than you have answers and you uh, also have no idea how to play the thing? Well, that's what happened to me with Sentinel Returns, a 98 release from Hookstone and also a follow-up to the beloved 1986 computer classic Sentinel, a game I had never played before, hence why I kinda had no idea what to do on this one. Now, of course, we live in dangerous times, but also times that allow us the convenience of manuals and online guides, so it didn't take me too long to figure out how to play Sentinel Returns, and once I got going, I found this one hard to put down. It's kind of a tough game to explain, but the gist of it is that you play as this telepathic entity who can essentially absorb parts of the land around them to convert into energy. Using this energy, you can then build structures and teleporters to help move across the map. The only catch though, is that you can only absorb items that are below you. So the goal is to absorb what you can, build a tower to get higher up so you can then absorb more stuff, and eventually you get so high that you can absorb what's known as the Sentinel, a giant ominous tower in the sky that's also hunting you down and screaming at you like a big mechanical eye of Sauron. Needless to say, you should probably try stay out of its sights. Now from what I can tell, while the gameplay is pretty much exactly the same as the original Sentinel, Sentinel Returns features a much darker, more twisted version of the world that you inhabit and one look at the main menu kind of gives that away too. Not to mention, the game also features the legend that is John Carpenter on soundtrack duty, which really just ties the whole creepy thing together. This right here was easily one of the biggest surprises for me on this list. It's a very unusual and unique game on the platform in terms of gameplay and overall aesthetic, but when you break it down, it's also just a really fun and addictive puzzle game. I know this may all look very confusing, but Trust me, if you give Sentinel Returns the time it deserves, I think you'll find one hell of a deep cut on the console. Plus, you know it has John Carpenter, so come on. ODT, aka ODT, Escape or Die Trying, is next on our list and comes from FDI, aka Cygnosis France, and in typical French fashion, we got ourselves a very interesting take on the action game formula. In ODT, you can play as one of four different characters stranded in a magical tower in search of an object known as the Green Pearl. Each of the playable characters are proficient in a number of different abilities, from gunplay, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and even magic powers. And what's cool about the game is that as you progress through it, your characters level up and you can then train them into a specific playstyle that suits you, meaning no matter what character you pick, there is a great deal of flexibility and customization on offer here. As for the gameplay itself, it very much reminds me of those classic PS1 action adventure titles. Think your Tomb Raiders, Death Trap Dungeons and Soul Reavers. Expect a lot of exploration, key finding, puzzle solving, and plenty of items and enemies to take out along the way. Now truthfully, the controls and movement here are a little bit janky and will likely take a little bit of patience to get to grips with, and there is also a healthy, healthy dose of draw distance limitations in this one too, so I hope you don't mind staring into the dark a lot. But even with those issues, I think what makes ODT stand out 
is how dense and atmospheric this game feels. The world, the characters, and especially the music do a great job at making you feel like you're exploring a strange unknown world. And I think this alone makes it a game worth experiencing, even with its uh, very clear issues. A rough gem, if you will, and one probably worth seeking out for those who like their PS1 games. Weird and janky. I know yous are out there. Well, 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 it was only a matter of time. Here's Formula One 98, the first Formula One game from Psygnosis without bizarre creations at the helm, and would you believe it, this is also commonly considered the worst Psygnosis F1 game as well. What are the odds? So this time around, a team by the name of Visual Sciences are at the helm, and while many things have been improved upon, mostly in the content and graphics department, where Visual Sciences have really dropped the ball with this one, is in three parts, the performance, controls, and the opponent AI. Simply put, Formula 198 just doesn't feel great to play, and it's not necessarily that the game itself is all that bad really, but in comparison to Formula 197, it just feels like a significant downgrade, and this becomes all the more apparent when you play them so close to one another. Frequent frame drops, really stiff and awkward driving controls, both in simulation and arcade modes, and some frankly brain-dead AI just make this a completely skippable entry in the long line of Psygnosis F1 games. And it's probably telling that this would also be the one and only F1 game Visual Sciences would work on with Psygnosis. So yeah, don't worry, things should probably get better from here on out for SIG's Formula 1 series at least. Well, I hope so, anyway. What better way to follow up a disappointing sequel than with a very good one? It's Colony Wars Vengeance, once again coming internally from Psygnosis. Now, even though this follow-up sees a reduction in the number of discs included in the package, this single-disc experience is still packing all the epic space combat, political intrigue, and stunning visuals you'd come to expect from the series. Vengeance takes place 100 years after the ending of the original game and actually sees you take the role of a member of the enemy forces from the original game, the Earth Empire, whose colonial navy are at the brink of destruction and are now fighting back in a last ditch effort to both survive and take revenge on their opponents. Hence the whole vengeance subtitle this time around. Once again, it is an excellent story with twists and turns. Some twists, definitely more notable than others, but I'll let you play it and find out for yourself. But the important thing is the gameplay remains as fun as ever, with intense space combat and an even larger variety of missions at the forefront. Plus, of course, the series branching mission system returns once again, so even if you're terrible like I am, worst case scenario, you're probably just on a collision course to one of the game's many bad endings. Outside of this, the game also features improved graphics, bigger ship variety, and even an upgrade system as some welcome additions. So, needless to say, if you enjoyed the first Colony Wars and Chance chances are, you will, then Vengeance is a no-brainer and once again, another must-have for fans of space shooters on the console. Next up, we have another game I reviewed in the past. It's Cyberdeck, aka the weird hoverboard game for kids that's also a Vans advertisement. And I'll let you in on a little secret. I do not like this game at all. Now, to be fair, as a concept, Cyberdeck is very much up my alley. It's a sort of extreme sports platformer hybrid that sees you move through a series of psychedelic and trippy worlds, performing platforming challenges, races, turret sections, and even boss fights. Unfortunately though, due to some very awkward controls, almost none of this stuff works very well, I am very sad to say. Almost all the issues in this game start and end with the player movement, which is basically the same as a racing game. Hold X to go forward and well, yeah, just figure the rest out as you go, really. It's just too fast and loose for a platforming game, and the level design is also too tight and awkward for a racing game. Even the trick system here is just too cumbersome to ever use outside of the boss fights, and if you ever do try to do them, it will oftentimes cost you a valuable life, which, trust me, you're gonna need to make it through this one. I'll once again leave a link to the full review in the description below if you'd like to learn more, but to sum it up, outside of some fun visual elements and some decent tunes, the game is a rare miss from Psygnosis and possibly one of the worst platformers on the console. Don't let the happy vans devil sucker you in like he did all those kids. Oh yeah, the devil steals kids in this game. That part's kind of funny at least. 
look, it's more lemmings. Well, technically it's lemmings and oh no, more lemmings. A compilation pack of the original lemmings as well as its standalone expansion pack originally released in the early 90s and developed by Scottish studio DMA Design. You might know them as the creators of Grand Theft Auto and also Uni Rally, which is frankly far more important. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the video, Treaty Lemmings was my first experience with the Lemmings franchise and it, uh, wasn't a very good one. Well, I'm glad to say this pack right here, ported over to the PlayStation by a studio named Distinctive Developments, is not only a much better way to experience Lemmings as a first timer, but I think I also now finally see what all the fuss is about. Once again, it is up to us to help guide a set number of lemmings to a goal by assigning some of the lemmings jobs to help with things like blocking, climbing and digging. And frankly, while I can appreciate the potential this formula has in a 3D space, the whole concept just suits its 2D roots much better in my opinion. It's a game that's simple and easy to pick up, while also allowing for near infinite levels of complexity as you progress through the game and get better. And seeing as this package contains both the original game and its expansion, it feels like there is near infinite challenges to get through. So as far as bang for your buck goes, there's really no better Lemmings package out there for original PlayStation owners. Although there's not really much competition since it's pretty much just this and Treaty Lemmings, but still, this is pretty great. Now, even with mouse support, are there better ways to try out this series? Oh yeah, 100%, but whether you're a newcomer to the series or just looking to have a ton of Lemmings action on your PS1, this collection is easily the way to go. We're entering into the home stretch and kicking off an Action Pack 99 with Eliminator, the first game from British studio Magenta Systems, who would mostly be known for their licensed kids platformers on the system, including Muppets Monster Mayhem and Stuart Little 2, which are both way better than you'd probably expect them to be. Well, Eliminator is nothing like those games. What we have here is a sort of hybrid of a vehicular combat game and an arena shooter. The game sees you play as a prisoner from the future, taking part in a televised series of combat events with the chance to win your freedom, or you know, die in the process. Now before checking this out, I noticed the game had a lot of very negative reviews, which didn't give me the highest hopes for this, but Eliminator might have been the single biggest surprise for me on this list. The game is a very fast paced high action race against the clock where you move through dark futuristic environments and take out a variety of cool mechanical and biological enemies. The idea is essentially that you're moving from one area to the next, dodging obstacles, taking out enemies and finding items until you complete the objective of that arena and then move on to the next one. The big challenge though, is the timer that's constantly ticking down, meaning you'll need to complete your objectives quickly while also hunting down precious pickups to extend the amount that you have left on the clock. Now these levels are pretty long and the gameplay is also quite tough, but I had a blast playing through this one, I'm not gonna lie. A lot of the negative critiques I read about this game seem to focus on the difficulty and handling, and while the vehicles in the game are very fast and kinda sensitive, this was another instance where I taught the vehicle control was quite good actually, allowing me to strafe around enemies and obstacles with relative ease, perfect for the action this game was throwing at me. I don't know, for me this was just a fun and unique take on a vehicular combat game, with lots of action, great visual and enemy design, and some damn good music too. If I had to pick one game as my sleeper pick from this list, it would probably be this one. You heard it here first everybody, Eliminator is good actually. So yeah, go buy it while it's cheap and nobody cares about it. A popular YouTuber is bound to pick it up someday, so you've been warned. Next up, we've got Retro Force, a PAL exclusive shoot 'em up direct from Psygnosis and released in March 99. I'm not sure why this game was never released elsewhere, cause if there's one thing the PS1 could always use more of, it's shoot 'em ups, particularly ones of the vertical 2.5D variety. Retro Force takes place in the year 2999, which sees our team of four playable characters, a boy, a girl, a robot, and a fat blue cat caught up in a time traveling adventure after some invaders 
steal an ancient artifact from their timeline. Anyway, it's a shoot 'em up, so the story isn't too important. What we're here for is some good old blasting and bombing, which Thankfully, the game does quite well. Each of the four playable characters have access to six weapons, three for taking out airborne enemies and three for taking out enemies on the ground. The game also has a gimmick which allows you to swap between lower and higher planes to avoid obstacles and the game even trolls in some rail shooter gameplay from time to time which is a fun little addition. Some people out there tend not to like this one very much, but I personally think it's a pretty fun 2.5D shoot 'em up on the console with some good music, nice graphics, and a lovely little aesthetic running through the whole thing. You can tell this game was put out just prior to the millennium, let's put it that way. So if you're a fan of shoot 'em ups or just enjoy big, mysterious blue cats, this PAL exclusive title should be one to put on your radar. <laughs> Another one I know a lot of you have been waiting for. It's finally time to take a look at Roll Cage, aka Wipeout on Wheels. Coming in March 99 from developer Attention to Detail, who were actually the studio behind the iconic Jaguar games Cybermorph and Battlemorph. Where did you learn to fly? Heh <laughs> you tell him, Green Lady. Alright, so calling this Wipeout on Wheels is really doing Roll Cage a disservice. Sure, the game does take some heavy inspiration from Wipeout in certain parts of its visuals and aesthetics, and also because it has an excellent licensed soundtrack, but Roll Cage offers more than enough unique gimmicks and chaotic fun to make it stand out on its own four wheels. As I'm sure you can attest, any game that lets you drive on walls and ceilings is certainly worthy of our time. Yes, the big selling point of Roll Cage is its cool all-terrain vehicles, which feature four big tires, allowing you to drive on pretty much anything in any direction. Sure, it can get a little disorientating and the cars have a tendency to flail wildly around the track on occasion, but like I said, it's just good chaotic fun. Throw in some fun tracks with nice visual variety, destructible objects in the environment that you can target with your weapons to take out opponents, kind of like a proto split second, some fun CGI cutscenes, and the aforementioned licensed soundtrack featuring some heavy hitters like Fatboy Slim, and well, you have one of the console's premier racing games on our hands. This is another game I think many will have at least played on a demo disc at some point in their lives, but if you've yet to play the full thing, assuming you can get accustomed to the very loose handling, Roll Cage is still a game well worth having in your collection. Another PAL exclusive and certainly one of the more obscure games on our list, Global Domination, is a real-time strategy game directly from Zygnosis that originally launched over on the PC but also found its way home to the PlayStation in March of 99. Now remember when I played Sentinel Returns and I had no idea what I was initially doing in that game? Well, the same thing happened here in Global Domination, where I was a little overwhelmed to say the least. Well, unfortunately, it was actually a little harder to get to grips with this game since the internet has all but pretended it doesn't exist, but after a little while, I was finally able to get to grips with it. So in this game, we play as an agent named Phoenix, who is part of a secret global agency going by the name Ultra, who was hired by countries all around the globe to assist in military defense and operations. In other words, we're kind of assholes, but you know, very rich assholes. The gameplay itself plays like a weird hybrid of RTS and Missile Command, strangely enough. Unusually, you're designated a home base on the map and have to defend ally nations from attacking nations by using a mixture of missiles you launch manually and units you can place around the map. Supposedly, it's based on a game featured in the James Bond movie Never Say Never Again, which, uh, yeah, that looks pretty close to be fair. Now, even though I did begin to understand the game the more I played it, this was still a pretty intense and overwhelming game to get into. It's something I'd probably need to sink more time into and uh, find a manual for if I really wanted to get the most out of it, but for now, I'm getting the feeling it's something that wouldn't really be everybody's cup of tea. That being said, it does have some incredible FMV cutscenes with a ton of actors hamming it up all over the place, which are also surprisingly high budget too. Psygnosis definitely put some money into this one, which makes it all the more surprising it never seen anything beyond a PAL release, but hey, at least it ended up somewhere. That's nice. Oh, thank God, a golf game. You know, I was feeling a little too overstimulated from the previous titles, so it's nice we have something to help balance things out. Pro 18 World Tour Golf from Intelligent Games is one of the many, many golf games available on the PlayStation, and as golf games go, 
Well, this is certainly one of them. Pro 18 is an interesting title as it goes for a mixture of landscape photography and 3D rendering and also FMV golfers for its gameplay, which creates this almost uncanny realistic look, which either looks really bad or really good depending on your personal tastes. The game features four courses based on real locations that are supposedly accurately designed around the real dimensions of the course. Now, I'm not all that familiar with them, so I can't judge it, but yeah, I'll take their word for it. Why would an old golf game go to the effort of lying to me, am I right? The golf mechanics themselves are similar to what you'd see in practically every other golf game around that time, so you'll be able to pick up and play this one with no problem. But I will say the controls and menu navigation are notably a little more complicated than the average golf game, and rather cumbersome, actually. It kind of feels like a port of a PC game that hasn't really been tailored over to the console all that well, and I suppose, considering this game also came to PC, well, that might just be the case. Regardless, this is kind of just a throwaway golf title on the console. Unless you're after the specific courses that appear in this game, you'd be better off with the likes of Actual Golf 2 or any of the Everybody's Golf titles, which are still the pinnacle of golfing excellence on the console. And you can trust me, a man who definitely knows a lot about golf. Well, it's been a few minutes since we last seen a PAL exclusive, and frankly, that's far too long. So here's Attack of the Saucer Man from Froob Industries released in the summer of 99. This right here is an action platformer and also another game I managed to review on the channel previously, and uh, it's fine. In this game, you play as an alien helping to safeguard the Earth from other more aggressive aliens. Now, it doesn't mean you won't be killing a few humans from time to time, but hey, it's in their best interest. So. I'll allow it. There's also some time travel thrown in for good measure too, cause that seemed to be all the rage in games from 98 and 99. Surprisingly, the game has quite a large amount of dialogue and story segments, which are actually pretty funny and one of the highlights of the game, really. The gameplay itself features a steady mixture of gunplay and platforming across large treaty environments, which often require a fair bit of exploration to make it true as well. Really, when it comes down to it, Attack of the Saucer Man is a functional but largely unexciting game that felt a little outdated even by the time it launched in 99, and while the game's blend of 2D and 3D is certainly a unique look, the game's unfortunately large draw distance limitations help make the worlds feel a little vapid and uninteresting to explore. As always, if you want to find out more about the game, I'll leave a link to the review in the description, but as far as Alien games on the PlayStation goes, this is one only the truest of true believers should look out for. It may have taken us a little while, but we're back into the dark cyberpunk world of the G-Police with the second and final game in the series, Weapons of Justice. As a sequel, this is very much on the same level of Colony Wars Vengeance, where once again, we have dropped the number of discs, but lost none of the series' high-octane action, and this time around, we've even added a new few features to boot. The story is a direct continuation from the original game, which now sees the G-Police assisting with the United Earth Militia in gang and peacekeeping operations. In this game, the environments have now grown in size, no longer requiring you to move through load screens to reach new areas, but as a result, the draw distance takes a hit even further, which, for me at least, kind of makes the game fall behind the original G-Police in some aspects visually, but even so, the game continues to look excellent and the action is as fun as ever. Controls have also been tweaked somewhat, now allowing you to strafe in the air, and newly included in this game, there's even some ground-based missions, seeing you drive cars and even pilot mechs on occasion. Now, these vehicle missions aren't really as fun as the flying missions in my opinion, but the added variety in vehicles and mission types do help break up what is another very long game packed to the brim with levels to keep you busy. Also, Stuart Duffield returns to provide another banger of a soundtrack that's equal parts atmospheric as it is dancey, one of the best in any Cygnosis game in my opinion. It's a real shame that this would end up being the final G-Police game, especially considering this game's cliffhanger ending. It's a series that could have been one of Sony's mainstays, and I dare to think what a modern G-Police game could have looked and played like. I mean, imagine this thing in VR. Ugh, I'm getting sad thinking about it. Still, the memory of G-Police does live on in its dark cyberpunk world and visceral aerial gameplay. We may never see it return, but it will always be one of the PS1's defining series, and that is a fact.
Up next, we have Kingsley's Adventure, a cute 3D platformer starring a little fox on his quest to become a knight in a kingdom of rabbits. Trust me, it, it works. This right here is the second game from Studio Camden, the same team responsible for the excellent Blast Radius, which you may remember from, I don't know, 15 or so games ago. Who's even counting at this point? Kingsley's Adventure is of course very different from Blast Radius. We're trading vehicular combat in space to jumping and slashing in a fantasy medieval land. Here we play as the orphan fox Kingsley, who's been adopted by the king and queen of the Fruit Kingdom. And after the knights of the Fruit Kingdom get brainwashed by some evil magic and turned into dark knights, it's up to the knight's apprentice Kingsley to go on a journey to save the kingdom and become a true knight of the realm. It's standard fantasy fare, but as those who've played Tunic can attest, if your main character is a cute tiny fox, you've got yourself a game worth playing. Well, if I'm being honest, I'd say Kingsley is at most a nice mid-tier platformer on the console. For a 99 release, it does feel kind of behind the times, still featuring the likes of tank controls, clunky combat, and some unfortunate draw distance issues. But Kingsley still does have a lot going for it, including a nice soundtrack, good bread and butter platforming, and a surprisingly nice atmosphere to the whole thing. The game kind of feels like a platforming take on a Zelda game in some ways, with the levels mimicking the puzzle solving of Zelda's dungeons, not to mention the many items and upgrades you will collect on your adventure. Don't get me wrong, this is still a pretty by the numbers 3D platformer at its core, but there's enough personality and unique elements here to make it worth a try for platforming fans, even with its notable flaws. Also, the characters talk like they're in a rare game, so... That's gotta be a bonus point at least. It feels like it's taken a very long time to get here, but finally, we've made it to Wipeout number 3, the third entry in Cygnosis' iconic anti-grav racing series, and also the one that took over Tara Street Station in Dublin. That may seem odd to bring up, but I did want to throw a little bit of weird Irish lore into the video wherever I could. Now let me tell you, the years have been very good to Wipeout 3, not that the previous games look bad or anything, but the third Wipeout is easily one of the best looking racers on the whole platform. The tracks, the environments, the ships, everything here looks cleaner and sleeker than ever before. And similarly, the Designers Republic is back once again for the final time to help give Wipeout one of its most visually distinct looks ever, giving the game this beautiful minimalist Y2K look, really showing how graphic design has changed and evolved since the previous two entries in the series. Although arguably, the biggest change to the series comes in the gameplay department with the addition of the boost button that allows you to speed up at the drop of a hat, but at the cost of some of your energy bar, giving the game a much higher skill ceiling and introducing an excellent risk reward system requiring you to prioritize healing when things get a little too dicey. This for me is the most complete version of the classic Wipeout racing experience. All the elements here combine to enhance the core gameplay of the original without taking anything away from what made it so good in the first place. Also, another big change comes in the soundtrack as well, with the game favoring a trance-heavy sound this time around, in no part thanks to a collaboration with Welsh DJ Sasha, who not only composed some original tracks for the game, but also contributed to one of the strongest licensed soundtracks in the series, featuring the likes of Underworld, Orbital, and Paul Van Dyke. Honestly, partaking in some anti-grav racing to the sound of Kittens or Expander, there's Really nothing else like it. There's usually a lot of debate over what's the best Wipeout game on the console, and really when it comes down to it, as much as I love the original Wipeout, 2097 and 3 are clearly leagues ahead of it. Which one you'll personally find best will come down to how you feel about the distinct visual styles of the two and the soundtracks, or where do you like having a boost button or not, but Come on, the boost button's pretty great, let's be fair. As for me, well, I can swing both ways, but purely from a gameplay perspective, I think Tree is the best playing of the bunch, but that's not to say it's my favorite Wipeout game on the console. We're just gonna have to wait a little while longer for that one. Closing out the year 1999, we have the aptly named Formula 1 99. Only this time, the one has changed from the number one to the letters O, N, and E. 
And no, I do not know why that happened. Also, for the first time, Sony themselves took over publishing duties in PAL region, but not in North America, where it is thankfully still L time. Now, after the setback that was Formula 198, what better way to get things back on track than with new series developer Studio 33, who you may remember from Newman Haas Racing, which was quite good, and as luck would have it, Formula 199 also quite good. This game right here would basically take the improvements that we did see in Formula 198, most notably the visuals, and then gives us the good racing gameplay that the franchise deserves. Now, in spite of the gameplay being admittedly pretty great in this version, Formula 199 still is a pretty skippable entry in the series in my opinion, and this mostly comes down to the lack of features in comparison to previous entries. Sure, there's still some great options and features here for fans of the simulation style games, but the arcade mode has been all but removed from this version of the game, similar to Newman Haas Racing. In fact, the whole UI and menu system of this game just feels noticeably bare bones, and the game is almost entirely lacking any music as well. It just kind of feels a bit empty. I don't know. I know these are kind of frivolous issues to have, but in comparison to what we've seen previously in this series, and also what we've yet to see, trust me, it just stands out for the wrong reasons. Anyway, not the worst F1 game in the series, and also certainly not the best, but hey, it's a good starting point for Studio 33 in what will come to be a busy couple of years for the studio. You'll see. Welcome to the new millennium. The Y2K bug has passed us by and the PS2 is on the horizon. But in the meantime, attention to detail are back once again, bringing you high octane racing action on the PS1 with Roll Cage Stage 2. You love to see it. This is another quintessential sequel where pretty much everything from the previous game has been brought back and enhanced. Better graphics, improved handling, more vehicles, more weapons, more tracks, more environmental variety, and packing one of the PS1's most underappreciated soundtracks too, with some heavy, heavy bangers, let me tell you. The biggest change this time around comes with the removal of the characters and their personal vehicles from the first game, and in its place, a new team-based system where you unlock better vehicles as the game progresses. These vehicles not only have enhanced stats, but each of the vehicles also has its own unique weapon setup. So depending on which vehicle you choose, that will decide the pool of weapons you can obtain while racing. So if you want to go for a more defensive speed oriented setup or something more aggressive, well, the choice is up to you. Roll Cage 2 is a content rich game as well. Unlocking everything this game has to offer will take you a while. And not only that, this, in my opinion, is one of the toughest racing games on the console. When you play some of the end game tracks at the highest speed, you are gonna be praying to Roll Cage Jesus to make it through a lap unscathed, no doubt about it. Anyway, as always, if you like fast racing games, great music, and cool sci-fi environments, Roll Cage Stage 2 is yet another no-brainer for your collection. Speaking of quintessential sequels, how about we look at a game that tried something a little bit different. It's the third and final Colony Wars game, Red Sun, releasing in April, of the year 2000. Now while the previous two Colony Wars games focused on galactic political warfare from the eyes of a soldier on two separate sides, Red Sun puts you in the shoes of a miner turned mercenary who experiences strange visions that end up entangling him in some of the bigger moments of the series. Since this game takes place around the same time as Vengeance, there's some noticeable overlap between the plot of this game and that game, but it relates to some pretty spoilery stuff that I won't delve into today. The important thing to note is that the space combat is once again as good as ever, only this time to mix things up, we also have some close range planet based missions as well, which are a nice change of pace really. The mission structure in this game is very different, where instead of moving through branching paths based on your mission success rate, since you're now a mercenary, you choose your missions from an available list, and upon completion, earn cash which can then be used to buy permanent upgrades and weaponry for your ships, which you can also upgrade for cash if you like. That doesn't mean the game doesn't have its own share of story missions and cutscenes too, there's still plenty of that, but the mission system and changes to the gameplay definitely make Red Sun stand out from the previous entries without sacrificing what made them so great in the first place. It's different, but in a good way. That's how I'd put it. And needless to say, if you enjoyed the first two, well, 
this one should be on your list as well. Similarly to G Police, it's a crying shame that this series lived and died on the PS1. It had so much potential, but for the brief time it was here, it definitely left its mark and will go down as another of the PS1's most iconic series. Would you look at that? Destruction Derby lives. Even with reflections moving on to arguably bigger and better things with the Driver series, Psygnosis still owns the rights to the series, so here's our new buddy Studio 33 back again to keep the series alive and kicking. And what did we get? Well, it's a Destruction Derby game, alright. Although, the change to a new developer does manage to make the game feel very different as a result. I guess the easiest way to explain it is that Destruction Derby Raw feels a bit more grounded this time, a bit more like a traditional racing game, especially when it comes to the modes, car selection, and most notably the car's handling. It's something you'll notice if you played the previous entries, but Reflection's handling always felt a little loosey-goosey, giving the games a very distinctive feel, which I felt played quite well into their Destruction Heavy Racers, but with Raw, Everything feels a little bit more rigid, which I think helps improve the racing aspect of the gameplay, but as a result, the process of crashing and bashing into other cars has lost a little bit of its luster. Now that's not to say the game isn't fun. One of the big improvements here are the additions of crash types, rewarding you points for taking out your opponents in more creative and destructive ways. And of course, Destruction Derby mode returns once again, and even with the less satisfying crash physics, I feel the game more than makes up for it with its arena design, giving you some great gimmicks, and even a whole additional mode dedicated to fighting on skyscrapers, which I mean, do I even need to say why this is fun? Another divisive update are the graphics, which are noticeably better in a lot of ways, but I think the overall design of the environments and cars especially lack a lot of personality. It's a very dark and I guess brown game? There's a lot of browns in this game, let's just put it that way. This honestly is another good destruction racer, but if I had to pick, I'd say this one is probably my least favorite of the bunch, but at the same time, I could also see how it might be your favorite in the series too. It really comes down to personal preference at the end of the day. Now thankfully, this wouldn't be the end of the series, as Studio 33 would put out one final destruction derby game on the PS2 in 2004 called Arenas, which is a... Yeah, it's fine, I guess. Really, if you want more Destruction Derby in your life, the best modern example would be Wreckfest from Bugbear Entertainment, which really is about all you could ever hope for from a modern take on the old Destruction Derby formula. But hey, on the PS1 at least, it's a series that certainly left its mark and will go down as another of the all-time classics. <laughs> So remember when I briefly talked about my favorite Wipeout game on the console? Well, say hello to my favorite Wipeout game on the console. It's Wipeout 3 Special Edition, an enhanced version of Wipeout 3 and notably also a PAL exclusive. So nowadays when we see Special Edition on a game, it usually means you get some bonus cosmetic content or like an art book or something. Well, with Wipeout 3, it was some minor improvements and also a bunch of extra tracks from previous Wipeout games as well. You'll see adjustments like tunnels being made a little bit brighter and also the inclusion of some prototype tracks that were previously only available in the Japanese version of Wipeout 3. Yes, the best version of the original Wipeout 3 is the Japanese version, plus it also has the best cover art too, so there you go. These prototype tracks are exactly what they say on the tin. Tracks that didn't make the final cut, but were added to the game via the use of this cool wireframe style that looks pretty damn awesome, I gotta say. Almost like a precursor to zone mode, which we'd see in later entries of the series. Also, this special edition includes even more prototype tracks than the Japanese version, including some experimental crafts that are frankly too damn fast, but hey, they're cool all the same. Although undoubtedly the best addition here is the inclusion of three classic tracks from the original Wipeout and five tracks from 2097, along with visual enhancements for each, bringing the total number of tracks up to a whopping 22, making this, without a doubt, the most content-rich Wipeout game on the console. Sure, it's disappointing we didn't get any of the musical tracks from the previous games or some of the classic ship designs, but hey, there is only so much space you can fit on a single PS1 disc, I suppose. So clearly, this is the definitive Wipeout game on the console, right? Well, it would be if not for one issue. It's a PAL-only release, meaning the game is locked to a 50Hz refresh rate and as a result, only playable at 25 frames per second. Now, if you're a PAL from the PAL region like myself, 
This probably won't bother you too much, but if you're a frame junkie and want your games as silky smooth as possible, well, this might be a deal breaker for you. Also, since the game was a late release, had a low print run, and is in high demand from Wipeout fans, it makes it one of the most expensive racing games you can purchase on the console, and the price is only going up too. I'd personally recommend getting the double pack with Destruction Derby 2 to save yourself some cash, but it's still gonna cost you. Although that being said, if you want to save some money and still get a great wipeout experience, I'd like to take a brief moment to shout out the PC game Ballistic NG, which is basically Wipeout 3 if it had workshop support, a perfect frame rate, and was also capable of replicating pretty much any generation of wipeout tanks to mods. And that includes the music too. Seriously, this game here is a love letter to classic Wipeout and a must own for any fans of the series. The game only costs like eight bucks on Steam and it gets new content all the time. So seriously, if you like Wipeout, do yourself a favor and buy this game. You can thank me later. Otherwise, that's it for Wipeout on the PS1. Arguably one of the most important franchises to ever appear on the console and sadly one of the only ones we've talked about today that still seems to be alive and kicking. Which, while sad, is a testament to the timeless gameplay of the Wipeout series. Truly one of the coolest franchises to ever grace gaming and in my opinion, its peak will always be the PS1 originals that started it all. <laughs> And now it's time for Team Buddies, the third and final game from Studio Camden, and I believe this is also the final PS1 game to feature the Cygnosis Owl in some form. Sure, it's a fun and unique version of the Cygnosis Owl, but still, it's the end of an era. Kinda sad, really. At this point, we were well into Cygnosis being absorbed into Sony proper, which meant the closing of many of their international and satellite studios and the main studio being renamed Studio Liverpool, and this right here seems to be the last project released by a Cygnosis studio, at least on the PS1 anyway. And what a game we got! Team Buddies is a true cult classic on the console, a very late release with a cute look and also a surprisingly high age rating due to a little foul language and gore. Team Buddies is a hectic hybrid of team-based action game and real-time strategy. You move around the map completing objectives, gunning down enemies, and most notably collecting boxes, which you can use to build weapons, vehicles, and even additional team members. And then you can command those team members to build stuff for you and themselves, and well, let's just say it gets, uh, pretty chaotic from here. The single player mode in this game tasks you with a wide range of objectives, from blowing up enemy bases, to stealing bikes, defending your base from bomb dogs, or even just bringing a farmer back his tractor in one piece. Sure, this is a game all about gunning each other down, but there is purpose behind it all, you know? Now don't let the game's cute and colourful visuals fool you. This is one tough game, with a surprising amount of depth to its gameplay, and with 8 worlds full of missions to keep you busy in single player, and a really fun multiplayer mode too. This right here is a game worth having in anybody's collection. Also, the game's soundtrack goes way harder than it has any right to. A big gun, that's all. Ugh, God, I love this game. Right, so remember how I said Team Buddies was the last game on the console to feature official Cygnosis branding and logos? Well, the remaining games on this list I figured I should include anyway, because firstly, they're all series and developers Cygnosis dealt with previously, and secondly, they've all been published by Sony themselves, who are also technically one and the same as Cygnosis anyway, so it's safe to assume if Cygnosis did exist at this point, it would have been them who published them. Plus, it's also an excuse to show off more games, and Hey look, if you stayed this long, what's a few more games, am I right? So yeah, here's Formula 1 2000, released in the year 2000, and once again from Studio 33. Also, try not to confuse this game with EA's new Formula 1 series called F1 2000, which is also being developed by Visual Sciences, the team responsible for Formula 1 98, aka the one nobody likes. Good luck with that, EA. So, good news everybody, Formula 1 2000 is once again another good Formula 1 game. It builds on the improvements we've seen in Formula 1 99 and solves the issues relating to missing content by adding back the arcade mode, which has now been retooled to feature unlockables and progression specific to arcade mode, meaning if you wanted to skip all the simulation stuff, there's practically a whole game's worth of content in the arcade mode, which is a great addition for more casual fans. Also, they added a little quiz during the load screen, which I am absolutely terrible at. My brain is just filled with dumb video game facts and nothing useful or cool, unfortunately, but hey, 
That's the life I chose. As for the gameplay itself, well, frankly, this is the best the games have felt since F197, not to mention the game continues to jump leaps and bounds in the graphics department. This right here looks like an end of life PS1 game, let me tell you. Of course, the game also features the expected 2000 updates to the teams and tracks, so, you know, you won't be disappointed here. As of right now, this is the only other F1 game that's come out that I would consider a must own next to F197, but you may just wanna wait a little bit before you commit to pay Picking this one up because. Hey, would you look at that? It's Formula One 2001, which made its way to the PS1 in October 2001. Who'd have guessed? This is also our only game from 2001 on the list, which is not surprising considering we're well into the 6th gen of consoles by now. But in spite of this game also coming out on the PS2 with Studio Liverpool themselves at the helm, Studio 33 is still trucking away making sure us lowly PS1 owners have something to tuck into. And in something you really don't see too much of nowadays, this last gen version of a multi-platform game has had a lot of love put into it, giving us what arguably might be the best and most complete F1 game on the console. In many ways, this game is just a further enhancement of what we've seen in Formula 1 2000, with more improvements and longevity to the arcade mode, a more refined version of the simulation experience we all know and love, more teams and tracks, and of course, a few more bumps to the graphics. I especially like the UI and menu design in this one. Once again, a very unimportant thing to compliment, but hey, I like what I like. Also, it has even more quiz questions this time around, so you know, clearly that worked out for them previously. The reason why I said hold off on Formula 1 2000 is because this right here is just a better version of that game, and if you're looking for the most graphically impressive and modern iteration of Formula 1 on the PlayStation, well, this right here is definitely the one to get. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, more Formula 1 games. Well, don't worry, this is the last one on our list and probably the weirdest and most obscure one too. It also happens to be a PAL exclusive because only people in PAL regions were buying PS1 games around this time, I guess. Once again, Studio 33 are behind the wheel on another racer, but this time around they dedicate the whole game to the arcade mode and not only that, they turn up the wackiness a few notches too by adding power-ups into the mix, making the game kind of like a Formula 1 kart racer hybrid or a more realistic F1 race stars. God, remember that game? That thing was weird. So if you ever wanted an F1 game that stays true to the look and feel of the sport while also throwing all the rules and regulations out the window, well, this is the game for you. Not only that, it's also a game for people who are really bad at Formula 1 games, but good at other racing games, so frankly, it's the perfect game for me. Now beyond the power-ups, which include things like speed boost, autopilots, and giant wheels, the game's single-player mode sees you racing through a series of classes, unlocking faster cars, and even completing bonus objectives on tracks, like collecting a set number of item pickups to unlock collectible mascots, which you then gotta seek out on the track. Sure, the package as a whole features less content than your regular Formula 1 games, but it more than achieves what it sets out to do, and that is create a fun and silly alternative for Formula 1 fans, and it's a shame it's kind of flown under the radar thanks to its late release and PAL exclusivity. Plus, it allows you to drive around in F1 cars with giant comedy wheels, so come on, 10 out of 10. Well, this is it, our final game on the list and maybe one of the console's biggest deep cuts. It's Firebugs, aka that other roll cage game, once again coming from attention to detail and published by Sony exclusively in PAL regions. Now, some people refer to this game as Roll Cage 3, some people call it Roll Cage Kitties Edition, but whatever you want to call it, Firebugs is very much a racer in the spirit of the Roll Cage games that came before it. The high octane all terrain racing returns, only this time with a more bright and cheery color palette and aesthetic, not to mention a new cast of characters and some fun new worlds and tracks to explore. I suppose the new look and younger characters are what give this game its reputation as a roll cage kids, but the game itself is also notably easier this time around with more forgiving AI and some notably smoother handling as well in my opinion. Now thankfully none of this takes away from the fun gameplay on offer, it just feels a little bit different while also remaining very familiar. I'd say it's more like a spin-off to roll cage than a true sequel, but Needless to say, if you're craving a little more roll cage on your PS1, it certainly won't disappoint. Also, the soundtrack is another sleeper hit on the console. It features a mixture 
feature great tracks from ATD's in-house composer ACK, and also notably some tracks from the Finnish group Bomb Funk MCs, who many will know from their 90s mega hit Freestyler, the video for which introduced me to the coolest man alive, who not only had the shiniest jacket around, but comes with a PS1 controller as an accessory. What a chat. Anyway, their songs, as you'd imagine, are pretty great. The essence, feel the presence, the mic intense, the flow that makes it pleasant, yes, we make a difference with the vibe. Now this would be the last official Roll Cage style game from ATD unfortunately, and another series to live and die on the PS1, I'm sad to say. But its spirit does live on, thanks to a game called Grip Combat Racing, which is very much the modern spiritual successor to the Roll Cage series. It's available on pretty much every platform, and is usually cheap as chips, so if you're craving a little more Roll Cage in your lives and have played through the PS1 games a few too many times, well, make sure to give this game a look. Well, there you have it folks, that's a brief look at every Cygnosis and Cygnosis adjacent game released on the PS1, or at least I think it was anyway. I'm sure if I missed anything, somebody in the comments will let me know in a polite and kind way that doesn't make a mockery of me in the slightest. Anyway, I hope that was a nice walk down memory lane and also a fun introduction to the diverse roster of games Cygnosis brought to the PS1. There's pretty much something for everybody here, and while not all the games were winners, with some being notably worse than others, the vast majority of games here are still worth playing today, many of which I consider some of the best games in their respective genres and definitive must-owns for the console. It's a shame Sony more or less eroded and eventually killed what was one of their most innovative and exciting studios, but you never know, Sony still do own the trademarks to Cygnosis and a wide variety of their franchises. Games like Colony Wars, G-Police, Destruction Derby, Team Buddies, these all still have the potential to come back in some form or another. Of course, going by modern Sony's AAA heavy strategy nowadays, the odds of this happening become increasingly more unlikely as time goes on. For me, personally, I would love to see Sony bring back Cygnosis and start a trend of retro revivals. The PS1 aesthetic has never been more popular thanks to the plethora of indie games replicating this style. If Sony could give us modern versions of classic titles but still keep the old PS1 aesthetic in place, that for me would be the perfect way to revive the Cygnosis brand and allow Sony to honour its history and many forgotten franchises, while introducing them to newcomers and old fans alike. Of course, it'll likely never happen, but hey, a boy can dream. Anyway, thank you for sticking around during what was almost definitely another obnoxiously long video. I learned a lot today, and I hope you did too. Of course, I'd like to give a very special thank you to my lovely Patreons who help make videos like this possible, including fine folks like Alan Castlin, Crimson Cyclist, Dave Nolan, Doma, Globe99, Kyle Winter, Moomatron, Moom and Biscuit, Trans Rights, Our Human Rights, Mr. The Joshmon, and Richard Kramer, who all subscribe at the Fan Plus Plus tier. I'll be back again soon with more long PS1 content, but until then, I'll leave you with some questions. What Cygnosis PS1 game was your favourite, and which series would you like to see return today? Let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you next time at another, uh, show. Christ, what am I saying?